Well, it is September 12th, 2003. It is my sister's 50th birthday. And it is the day after a day of remembrance. The families have gathered, spoken, wept, and today they return to their homes, some even getting on airplanes as they go. City employees in white coveralls have put away all the folding chairs and have begun to sweep up the trash left by the grieving men and women who have themselves gone back to work for one more day before the weekend. The morning news has resumed coverage of Arnold's first run for office, J. Lo's latest wedding, and what to do with Yasser Arafat in Israel. In other words, it's back to business as usual. Two years ago, it wasn't quite like that. And two years ago, people were desperate for answers and were asking questions like, who did this? How did it happen? And not the least of their questions was, where was God? Not that that was the best question, just one of the more frequently asked. It's easy to understand why they asked it. We sometimes get the idea that God will provide for us in certain ways. We get the idea that his blessings are somewhat predictable. They become routine. And then when he doesn't do quite what we expect or provide quite the blessing that we anticipated, the protection that we thought we had earned, we question his presence. Not the best instinct on our part but a common one. It is what happened in the Old Testament when you go back and read some of the Psalms. Some of the Psalms as uh, individual Israelites were laboring under captivity, their oppressors would say to them things like, where's your God now? If you have a God who protects you, why this? If he's your shield, why has this been able to get to you? They asked it of Jesus as they taunted him on the cross, Matthew 27. He believes in God. Where is God now? Let God rescue him now. He calls himself the Son of God. Let God deliver him. I do hope that at this point, most of you understand that God is not a vending machine that his actions are not so predictable that we can insert the right kinds of coins, pray the right kinds of prayers, and get the right kind of product back. I also hope that most of us realize that experience is not a reliable indicator of the presence and power of God. Where was God on 9-11? Well, he was precisely where he was on Good Friday identifying with us in our suffering, acting to resolve that suffering in ways that we may not see or imagine, sovereign in the heavens, accomplishing his eternal purposes. He's there also on September 12, 2003. I believe we need to say that with confidence because it is at the heart of the Christian confession that Christ, having... Uh, come to us as the Son of of God the Father Almighty, was himself crucified, was buried in this place. That this world, the kind of world that crucifies the Son of the Almighty, was then left behind by him when having been raised from the dead, he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, from which he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And so we anticipate that this world will one day be judged and will one day be a place of righteousness. We know it is not that yet. We know that this is not yet the day of justice. We know that this is a place of injustice. This is where the Son of the Almighty is crucified. So we do say that with confidence. And when asked where was God, we rightly say he was not absent, 
but he was not seen in the way you expect. But I have to tell you today that I worry a bit for all of us when we say that. Again, it's central to the Christian confession. It's the nature of our hope that this is not the place of justice. But sometimes our response to evil and suffering becomes so easy for us. We get good at it. We get really good at recognizing trouble and explaining it. We might, in that sense, be able to defend God's existence, which is part of our obligation, I suppose. But I'm not sure that an argument for his existence is always what we really need. And I say that to you as a theologian and sometime apologist who sometimes has to say something philosophical about the existence of God. But I want to speak to you as a comrade, as a fellow who recognizes that sometimes it's more than existence that we need. Frederick Buechner tells a story of what would, have ha- what would happen if God just decided to definitively prove himself. If he took all the letters of, or all the, the stars of the Milky Way and just wrote in them, I am, and hung it out there for everyone to see. And lest anyone miss it, he would change it just a little bit every night. Maybe write it in a different language. Maybe change it depending on where the sun was relative to earth so that everyone could look up and see in their own language, I am, I exist, God is. And we don't have proof. And then at some point, Buechner says, some little kid standing next to his father is looking up at it and says, so what? And at that point, everything goes back to normal. Because if God exists, but we don't sense some difference from the reality of his existence here and now, then the child's question haunts us. So what? And some of us might instinctively respond to that by saying, well, if he exists, then we know there are certain things that we're supposed to do. But I would suggest to you that's not enough. Psalm 27, 13 says, I would have despaired had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Not just, it doesn't say I would have despaired if I hadn't known what to do. I would have despaired if I had not known what rules to follow. It says, I would have despaired if I had not seen God's goodness showing up, not just out there in the future, where someday I will see His blessing, but right now, in the land of the living. I would suggest to you that most of us can do pretty well learning to live with disappointment. Unfortunately, we do not do well living with disappointment while still hoping for the goodness of God in the land of the living. I saw Jim Wallace this morning. Jim and Tracy are proud parents of a brand new baby, for which we're so grateful. It's their second child, and now they're only, because their first baby died. And when you're pregnant with your second baby, after losing your first, you don't hope quite the same way, do you? You don't um, 
You don't wrap all your expectations in that event the way you did the first time around. I know because our first baby, as many of you know, is that big lug that works out with me at the Landry Center in the mornings, Steve, who's now 17. Steve was born with Down syndrome. And when we heard that news, we heard all kinds of, or we saw all kinds of expectations come crashing down. And I will tell you that the next time around, as well as the third and the fourth, we didn't think about it quite the same way. Because fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. If I don't expect much, I won't be disappointed again. This summer, I had the opportunity to speak to uh, some folks at a Johnny and Friends family retreat. It was for families that had experienced disability in one way or another, most of whom had, had disabled children. And I asked one of the dads in, in one of the com- private conversations, I said, so, so what do you hope for? When you think about hope, what does that look like for you? And he said, well, I have to tell you, I don't much hope. He said, I, I've been let down enough, I, I just don't hope much. And there is some value in resignation. I'm not saying that we should be naive. There, there's, there's value in resignation like, Uh, Anne Lamott uh, talks about with her friend whose evening prayer is, oh well. I kind of like that. (laughs) Um, But in our resignation, I don't want it to cost us hope. Because again, if, if it costs us hope, it's despair. And as I looked out at those families at the Johnny and Friends retreat, and as I look out at you all, and as I look here on the stage where stories I know, I just have to believe that the Christian life consists of more than resignation and a set of rules. We need hope for the day. We need the presence of God to help us survive. Most of us are no longer asking, where was God in our moment of grief? We're not asking whether he exists. We're asking whether it matters. We're asking what it feels like today to say that he's present. And to that end, I I would invite you to look with me very briefly at one verse. And you know it already probably, so maybe you don't even need to turn to it, but I'll turn to it. Lest they think I didn't bring my Bible. (laughs) Psalm 46, verse 1, says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Note, He is a help in trouble. Because there will be a day when He banishes all trouble away. There will be a day when He wipes every tear from our eyes. There will be that day. We know this is not that day. And that means that at this moment, like enemies seated together at the same dinner party, God and trouble are under the same roof. In the language of Psalm 23, when I walk through the valley, thou art with me. And some of us have gotten really good at looking for trouble. Not trying to experience it, I hope, but we've gotten really good at looking for trouble in the sense that we identify it, we label it, we explain its presence as we call it by name. Well and good. I'm not sure that we are as good looking under that same roof for God. Because even though this is the day of trouble, it is also a day in which God shows up. Frederick Buechner writes, The world and all of us in it are half in love with our own destruction and thus mad. The world and all of us in it are hungry to devour each other and ourselves and thus lost. 
That is not just a preacher's truth, a rhetorical truth, a Sunday school truth. Listen to the evening news. Watch a television. Read the novels and histories and plays of our time. Read part of what there is to be read in every human face, including my face and your faces. But every once in a while, every once in a while, in the world and in ourselves, there is something else to read. There are places and times, inner ones and outer ones, where something like peace happens, love happens. Light happens. And when they happen, we should hold on to them for dear life because, of course, they are dear life. They are glimpses and whispers from afar that peace, light, love are where life ultimately comes from. That deeper down than madness and lostness, they are what at its heart life is. By faith we know this. And I think only by faith because there is no other way to know it. And I ask you this morning what that looks like in your experience. You've had classes on the means of revelation. You know that sometimes God makes himself known in different ways. And I ask you if you've seen him. We know from Scripture, Psalm 19, Romans 1, that God is present in creation. Do you take the time to notice? Do you take the time to see Him there? Last summer, my parents took us on a cruise. It's pretty fantastic. Suggest that to all grandparents, by the way. (laughs) Um, That was great. We went on a cruise to Alaska. And one night, I was out on the deck by myself, just looking. Just looking at the sunset that in front of me was lavender and behind me was orange and had streaks of both on the water back and forth and the water was just perfectly flat and placid. And that big ship is just cutting its way right through it silently. And way up ahead, under the lavender of the sky in front of me, I saw a large fin pop up out of the water. And then another one. And I realized that a small pod of orcas was coming our way. And it came, they came toward us. And as they got closer to the boat, naturally, they went under. And I'm watching. I'm watching behind me. And as I turn behind me, I'm thinking, no way they're going to pop up there. Yes, they popped up there right underneath the setting sun. I see them pop up to the surface again. And I didn't have a camera, but I didn't need one. And I said, at that moment, that's a touch of grace. This summer, the planet Mars, as you know, was rather close. Er. Uh, (laughs) One astrophysicist was asked, is this really a significant scientific event? And he said, let me put it this way. It's kind of like standing in Manhattan, taking a step toward New Jersey and saying, I've never been this close to Japan in my life. (laughs) But it was closer, okay? And it was cool. And so when I was down in in Waxahachie for the Johnny and Friends retreat, I, I went out walking one night. And I I was so burdened for the people there, I was just praying. And I wasn't doing any kind of, you know, territorial prayer walk around the perimeter. You know, I I wasn't doing that kind of stuff. I, I was just walking, okay? And I'm just praying to God who didn't care about geography. And, And as I prayed for those people, some of those people whose stories I was getting to hear and who I thought, Lord, if you don't show up, these people are going to die. And I looked up and I'm looking at the clouds and the clouds are parting and there's rays of moonlight coming through the clouds like sometimes you see with sunlight. And it parted a little bit further and there was Mars right by the moon. And it 
wasn't a miracle. I'm not saying it was. What I'm saying is it was a sign of grace. And I took it that way. And so I, I told everybody the next morning when, when I talked to them, I said, you know, rather than just staying in your rooms tonight, you ought to go out and look. And that night it just poured down the rain. <laughs> I mean, just poured rain. And I went out in the rain to get the kids because they're on the other side of the camp. And I looked up, and through the clouds, there was a hole where you could see the moon and Mars. It wasn't a miracle. You might just call it a nice thing to see. But I took it as the hand of God. And it wasn't a definitive proof. I mean, that's not the sort of thing that I would walk into a group of non-Christians and say, hey, let me tell you something that I saw where I saw God. They just say it's a nice thing. I guess what I'm saying is that sometimes, maybe in a fallen world, a few nice things might count as minor miracles. And that for those of us who have hope in Christ, they might count as a bit of the scent of heaven, a glimpse from afar. We recognize that God is present in His Word in addition to present in creation. Psalm 119 says, This is my comfort in my affliction, that thy word has revived me. And right now, you all are studying that word so much that it's killing you. And what I'm asking is, do you give it a chance to revive you in the midst of it killing you? Do you look for Him in it, or do you just look for a way to get your grave? We see His hand in providential mercy. Dad's here today. A lot of you prayed for him. He, in the last year, after the Alaska trip, had two strokes and a heart attack. Um, The first stroke made it hard for him to walk. And um, some of us had to stand alongside and help. It was something to see at Christmas when he got up and walked to the door. Not a definitive proof, not a miracle but the hand of God. My son Steve had a rugged year a couple years ago at school. He was in a school in a place where people didn't understand him and didn't love him. Last year, getting to go see his Christmas musical for Notre Dame School of Dallas, the Catholic school for disability for kids with disabilities where people know him and love him. Getting to see that musical was a taste of heaven for us. Again, these things that doesn't make up for the fact that there are other people not so fortunate. That doesn't make up for the fact that there are other people whose children are not now understood or whose dads now die. Because this is not yet the day of justice. It's the day of injustice. But in the day of justice, of injustice, a bit of mercy can be for us the fragrance of heaven. God is present in the community of believers. <clears throat> and I hope you learn from each other as God shows up through each of you. I think about a conference in San Diego where I was evaluating how people were worshiping and reminded that I needed to worship. I think about my mother-in-law experiencing all kinds of physical infirmity these days. And I think about my wife serving her and being for her the presence of God. 
I think about Lanier, who prayed for me, and who I dearly love. And I think about um, his story last week, where when he told his family that he had cancer, and he wept, as he held their hands, he said he felt tears falling on both his arms because they were crying too. Psalm 46 says, Be still, cease striving, and know that I am God. Can you grow still enough to see? Do you recognize what you're seeing? When you look in the faces of these faculty members, when you see that they're tired, when you see lights left on late, when you look into one another's faces, when you read your Bible, when you take a walk and see the quiet beauty of God's creation, would you please take a deep breath and see what you're seeing? You're seeing that God is present in the midst of trouble. There's also more. And for some of you, this may be the most important thing I can tell you this morning. And that is that God shows up in the presence of believers. That He shows up through the community also means He wants to show up through you. That your words, your presence, your touch, your service may well be for someone else the presence of God. That when you show up, you may be the one who carries just a little bit of the scent of heaven. And I have to tell you, I'm trying to learn to do this better. Um, I'd just be a whole lot more comfortable if what God expected of us was to come and to give a moralistic, moralistic and impersonal sermon. Because those are easy. But He expects us to live it out. No doubt imperfectly until that day when we see Him. And sometimes we do pretty well. I think I've had my moments of showing up well. But sometimes I don't do it so well. And sometimes, believe it or not, even this place gets to me a little bit. Maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> I can get a little impatient with that. Sometimes I forget names, I neglect prayer. And I don't always take time to talk. And I think of times when I've let people down by not showing up the way I want to wholeheartedly. And all that to say that this is that kind of day. This is is an ordinary day. This is a day when people fail us and we fail them. This is the day after a day of remembrance. It is my sister's 50th birthday. It's a day of work, a day of return to normal. It's a day of occasional private celebration. It's a day in which there is trouble. And it's a day in which there is God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. My prayer for you and for me is that may God make his presence known to you. Because that's a promise only he can keep. I can't make that happen. All I can say is he claims he will be your refuge and strength and will be present in trouble. All I can say is he'll have to fulfill that promise for you. May he make known his presence to you. May may he make known his presence through you until the day when he dries our tears forevermore. May we see him and may others see him in us. A taste of heaven even in the most ordinary of days. Our Father, we thank you for your kindness toward us. We thank you for being for us a safe refuge 
Help us to see your presence. Help us to see you. May you truly be our vision on these ordinary days. In Jesus' name, amen.